Good morning. Probably tell you, first of all, the difference between uh, the society and the trust, because people might be thinking, why do we need to hear from two charities having got up so early in the morning? We're a bit like the difference between Cancer Research UK and Macmillan. The society is very much focused on research and doing some of the campaigning. We're about helping people with MS to have the best possible lives that they can. We're also quite a bit smaller than the, than the society as well, but nothing necessarily wrong with that. The headlines of what I'm going to tell you this morning is um, really uh, going to touch upon the variants, reprove the variances there, particularly in the use of MS nurses across the country, and I'm going to reveal some headlines of some new research that's going to actually be punish, published in the next 48 hours or so. And I'm going to show you eight proposals, eight things that all of you can do to take back to where you're working to increase your capacity, whether you're a consultant or an MS specialist nurse. So the reality is this is the scale of the problem. Much of what I'm going to say this morning comes from a fantastic and compelling report called the MS Forward View. So I wasn't involved with the trust when it was actually developed. There, actually, there were people in this room that helped to develop this report. But I think a lot of the answers of what we need at the moment to reduce variation are actually in this compelling report. So you can see from this bar chart, and as colleagues from Merseyside might disagree with how the, the evaluation was done at the time, but it clearly shows that there's a variation between those different areas. And the document, it was only written in 2016, but Forward View was really clear about the direction of travel. It said, the increase in workload will be challenging or indeed impossible for MS teams to deal with unless they work differently. So there is variation, but what can we do about it? Well, this is a map that we've done. We, we carried out the first mapping, and we're going to republish again this again in the next month or so. But this was the situation about MS services, particularly around MS nurses, in 2016. And you can see on the map, there's quite a, bit of, um, quite a few areas of red, quite a few areas of uh, orange. Those are the areas that, in our view, on the, the measuring that we're doing, didn't have enough MS nurses. So everybody be trying to work out, is my area in there or not? Let me tell you a bit of a story. I want to paint you a picture of two ladies, two sisters called Susan and Jane. They've both got relapsing and remitting MS. Jane lives in London. Susan lives in Somerset. They should receive similar support, but the reality is very, very different. So as I said, Susan lives in Somerset. In North Somerset, they've got some of the best provision of MS specialist nurses in the country. So the caseload there for each of the three MS nurses is around 109 people with MS. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Jane. Jane, this is, and this is areas rather than specific services. But Jane lives in Newham in East London. In 2016, so it's a couple of years ago, in 2016, this area had some of the least adequate provision with an estimated caseload well in excess of 1,000 people with MS for each nurse. That's the difference that we're seeing. That's the difference we're hearing about. So from the MS forward view, there's a stark statistic that two-thirds of people with MS, two in every three people, are living in an area where the MS nurses have caseloads in excess of the sustainable figure of 358 people. And that, in reality, is the challenge that faces us all. These are some of the headlines of that report I mentioned. We've got our MS Trust Conference itself on Sunday. I'd be hung, drawn, and quartered if I gave you all of the results of the, the information that's going to be published on Sunday. But let me give you a few broad headlines. The good news is the number of MS specialist nurses had actually increased over the last couple of years since we last done this research. Um, please don't quote this, but that figure's gone up by about 4% by nine whole-time equivalent MS nurses. So at least the direction of travel is good. The reality is that there's still significant variation in caseloads of the MS nurses. We now believe almost one in seven people with MS now live where MS nurses have caseloads in, in excess of that new sustainable figure. So the reality is that the increase in the number of MS nurses hasn't been rapid enough count to counteract that lower sustainable figure and the increase of number of people with MS. And there's a stark message in that report which says, 
there remains significant variation in cage loads of MS specialist nurses across the UK. And the report will say that at least 66 zero MS, new MS nurses are still needed to ensure fair access to an MS nurse for every person living in the UK. So there is variance, and I think I've shown this morning with the report, and please have a look at the MS Trust website next week, that variance is getting worse, particularly for people like Jane and Susan. But on behalf of my charity, the MS Trust, before I start and put some solutions on the table, I'd like to apologise. There are solutions that we, and probably some people in this room, know, have known about for a couple of years. There are two great reports which we inspired and helped to create, but actually quite a lot of the ideas came from people in this room and in the MS community. But I'm afraid that we, as the MS Trust, haven't done enough to persuade you and others in the community to take on some of those proposals. So in reality, those reports have been buried on our website. So these are those reports. One is MS Forward View, a consensus for the future of MS services. And the other is improving the efficiency of disease modifying drug provision. And if I've reread them this week before making this presentation, I think they're as compelling today as when they were first published. Just give them a bit of credibility, the signatories included the MS Society, the Association of British Neurologists MS Advisory Group, and the RCN. And here's just a line from the report, which was effectively a state of the nation of the MS community in 2016. Vital symptom management and multidisciplinary services are patchy or unavailable in many parts of the UK with more than half of neurology patients reporting pr problems accessing the services of treatments that they need. Now, the good thing is this report set out the priority actions needed to improve equity, efficiency, and effectiveness of RMS services for the likes of Susan and Jane. So what I'm going to do is streamline what's in those reports. Please go away if you've got the time to read those reports. But if you haven't, here are eight proposals which I believe would reduce variation in the provision both of MS nurse specialists in particular and our MS nurses. And some of these proposals will help increase the capacity of neurology consultants at the same time. So number one, no surprise, more MS nurses. So obviously I need to declare an interest. The MS Trust's primary goal is for more MS nurses. And John here is in Leicester, is one of the new MS nurses that we funded in the last 12 months. As Georgina mentioned a couple of moments ago, 45% of people said in Georgina's survey, my MS, my needs survey, that their MS nurse is their key contact for, the, for their health and their care. But as I've just mentioned, in 2018, almost seven in every 10 people in, uh, are now living in areas where their MS nurses have a caseload in excess of the sustainable caseload figure. Now, the bizarre situation, and something I've found really quite extraordinary, somebody relatively new to this sector, is that each MS nurse saves the NHS £77,000 in reducing GP time, reducing time in A&E, and reducing unplanned hospital admissions. That's a net saving of £77,000. So we at the MS Trust, we've tried to do something about it. We funded uh, an additional three nurses in the last year in Leicester, in Bradford, and at Lanarkshire. And in the next year, we're going to fund another 10. But with the current shortfall of at least 60 MS nurses, we can't bridge that gap on our own. The second proposal is to have more MS nurse prescribers. Let me quote Forward View directly to you again. Services should consider whether independent prescribing symptomatic treatments by MS specialist nurses would improve services for people with MS. And it says there's scope for more widespread nurse prescribing to improve both the efficiency of the DMB, DMD management process and the convenience of people with MS themselves. And then the fellow, um, 
the other report, the DMD report, is saying freeing up time for MS nurses will enable them to provide leadership for the whole DMD pathway and give um, time to symptom and relapse management and the care of people with advanced MS. So it could enable them to take over some DMD-related functions from neurologists, such as repeat prescriptions. Number three, I'm sure I won't um, surprise you, is about more MS nurses ordering MRI scans. Forward view again, DMD monitoring could be made more efficient if MS nurses were empowered to order MRI scans in advance of neurology reviews so that these could be ready and available for the consultation. The fourth idea, and this is something I was talking about with one of the big pharma companies only earlier this week, is each MS team should have a DMD coordinator. It makes such sense. So Forward View said every MS team that is prescribing or monitoring DMDs should include a non-clinical DMD coordinator to manage the process. And the specific DMD report said in larger teams, efficiencies can be gained by including a DMD nurse within the team who can do the DMD reviews, review blood test results, and undertake, undertake um, injection training. And in smaller teams, this function can be combined with a wider administration role. It says this will free up time for the MS nurses, enabling to provide leadership for the DMD pathway. And it says the scope for MS nurses to work at a more specialist level enabling them to free up neurologist time. And this will help MS services to get the best value out of specialist resources, making them more efficient and more sustainable. Football. I know we talked about rugby last night, we talked about cricket. Let's think about football for a minute. There was a big match last night involving our premiership champions, Manchester City. They won the quarter-final of a cup game 2-0, playing up the road in Manchester in the Etihad Stadium. There were about 40,000 people in the Etihad last night. Looked to be quite a big crowd. It crystallised our thought because, in our view, that's probably the number of people with advanced MS in this country at the moment. So our 2016 report, Improving Services for People with Advanced MS, highlighted that this was an area that was often neglected. So my fifth proposal is to introduce advanced MS champions who will coordinate care for people with advanced MS across different existing services. So we're introducing six champions over the next couple of years with lots of different pilots. So Lindsay Lord here on my slide is our first champion in Salford. And we know that as part of the pilot, we will need to demonstrate that champions like Lindsay will actually save the NHS money, as well as ensuring that people with MS get a better service. So the six champions will start to help, but more will be needed to deliver a truly equitable service. The sixth proposal, probably a bit more controversial, less face-to-face -face meetings. And that's not less, or it doesn't give you an excuse to go back and have no meetings, but there's quite an interesting line that wasn't really picked up in the major proposals, but the full review said there may be scope to cut down on routine face-to-face -face appointments with people with the MDs without compromising safety. St George's in London that we heard from a couple of minutes ago, they run a weekly clinic in two locations for blood tests without people seeing their MS nurse. But the reality, and this is only it's in 2016, but it's only two years ago, things might have changed. But according to Forward View, only 32 out of 148 prescribing and monitoring centres reported that they were able to schedule blood tests without the need for a specialist nurse or neurology appointment. Here we go, better use of data today. Let me give you a story. Preparing for this, preparation, for this presentation, I was talking to somebody from a hospital in the south of England. That's as close as I'm going to go. And they told me that their blood monitoring schedule is at the moment put on a whiteboard include some of the data and some of the numbers. Two weeks ago, somebody made a delivery, the whiteboard's next to the door, and guess what happened? That was the whiteboard after it was wiped by somebody's sleeve. That's the reality of parts of our NHS in 2018. Obviously, any IT system will be better than that system, 
But the seventh proposal I'm putting back on the table is a better use of IT and data, in particular the better use of information it provides. According to the DMD report I've referenced, only 28 out of 107 centres use an IT system or database to keep track of DMD monitoring. And I was talking to Salford only last week, and they told me that they couldn't provide a safe and consistent service without the great new IT system they've got at the moment. So Forward View was very clear about this. It said MS teams need effective IT systems that talk to each other so that they can review test results, and re reduce the need for face-to-face -face appointments. And the eighth of eight ideas and proposals is a better sharing of best practice. I've just mentioned the IT systems at Salford. I mentioned the, the, face, the, the reducing face-to-face -face meetings at St. George's. Both of those ideas are on, our ha on the MS Trust website. So we've got an area of that website for health professionals, and part of that website has a whole list of best practices. There are pockets of best practice in the MS sector which could lead us to make better use of our existing resources. My experience so far, 11 months into the role, is we're not showing up best practice enough. So I've got one to say to you, we have to ask ourselves why the best practice is often being overlooked at the moment. So there is a zone, it already exists. So my plea to you today is whatever we decide to do this afternoon, let's not try and reinvent the wheel. And coming to a close now, one of the things, it's not necessarily a proposal, but one of the challenges is, again, as a newcomer to this area, I'm surprised at how little we are looking at other areas. In one conversation I've had recently, I was told that the nurse caseload for both Macmillan and Parkinson nurses is significantly higher than the multiple sclerosis sector. I'm not saying what's right and what's wrong, but I think we've got to start asking ourselves more questions than we've got at the moment. So it seems to me there are two options facing us today and in the future. We can either rebury those two reports that I've put back on the table on the MS Trust website and forget about them once again, or we can embrace some of these eight proposals when we go back to our jobs, reduce variation in our sector, and ensure more consistent service provision for people like Jane and Susan. Thank you. Helen. Thanks very much, David. Helen Ford from Leeds. And I know there are a lot of specialist nurses in the room. Mm. I mean, my observation is over the last 20 years, the complexity of the MS specialist nurse role has changed enormously. And um, you know, with the huge DMT services now, the nurse prescribing, responsibility for monitoring. So in actual fact, I wonder what you think about in terms of at the numbers that you're quoting, as we increase the responsibilities and change the roles of MS nurses, actually, I don't think the numbers tell the whole story because mm. of the changing complexity of the role. And certainly everything that we're hearing at the moment, and I was talking to an MS nurse just a couple of days ago, she said her job now, in the last three or four years, it's fundamentally changed. It's almost all about monitoring and she said the ability to care has almost disappeared, and that's a, it's a really sad. So I think if we can build some capacity back into the system, whether it's with DMD coordinators, whether it's more admin, you know, Forward View also said that if each, each nurse was supported by 0.6 of an admin role, that would allow them to be more, uh, more efficient and more strategic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I work in Luton, not far from MS Trust, and thank you for the uh, areas that you highlighted that would help to improve services, MS nurses. And I agree with, uh, across my colleague there, amount of complexity has been put on. You are asking for MS nurse to uh, order an MRI. It, take, it takes time. So you are not including that. 358 numbers, I fully agree, is just a number. Mm. If you go to center that it does all that, and I'm very keen to discuss with you or anybody in the room about nurse prescribing. I was part of the UK MSNA for some time and we uh, audited or did a hands up. Who wants to prescribe? It was only about 50% who mm. wanted to prescribe. 
Priority one, having been prescribing for some time now, I don't feel I am well supported by the organization, by the NHS itself. And I'll tell you why. Our medical colleagues here, they do earn their salary and they do have litigation uh, insurance policy to cover them. We don't have that. I checked out, I'm debating that in our trust now, as I'm the representative for the NMPs. To get an insurance policy, it's going to cost me 1,500 pounds. You, you are asking me, sorry, I don't mind me to point finger at you. <laughs> you are asking me to prescribe, but you are not actually providing me with a, a, a provision to protect myself. I am delivering a service, better service, but I have to pay out of my pocket, having trained, pay out of my pocket as a nurse to protect myself. I think that's an appalling way of looking mm. at the MS nurses to deliver a service. You are expecting us to develop our skills, however you're reluctant to pay to reimburse. A simple thing about the insurance policy. <coughs> Coming on the insurance policy today. Sorry. I did know about it. I'm, I'm certainly prepared to go away and look at that and see what we can do as a wider organisation to try and influence that more uh, and support the nurses more. Because actually, if it's going to cost you and some of your other colleagues, whether it's in Luton or elsewhere, we need to be trying to do something like that to make it, again, to make it more equitable for staff as well as for people with MS. Um, hello, Sarah White from St George's. Um, again, thank you for bringing the forward view back into focus. As Hussein has said, one of my concerns is that some of those proposal, proposals about MS nurses ordering scans, um, signing prescriptions, actually puts us um, in an already overstretched service. Mm. It focuses more time on, on the patients that perhaps um, are on DMT and gives us less time for those patients with progressive uh, MS that perhaps need more of our care. And also, um, I think there's a lot of value in being very responsive. So if patient phones and relapse or mm. they've got an infection, in being very responsive to that, keeping people out of hospital, getting them in and treated quickly. Yeah. But actually, if we're going to be there sitting there ordering scans and signing 60 prescriptions every week, that mm. takes that time away. So I think we have to be very careful about the skills that we have as specialist nurses and actually mm. using those skills wisely mm. rather than just helping the consultants in perhaps what has been their, their role. That's right. And it's balancing. It, it's thinking, if we were going to reinvent the service today, what would it look like? We're, we're not talking about that today. But the reality is, I hear time and time again from some of the specialist nurses I know that their role, it's a lot about monitoring, but there's more, much more admin than they want and they need. So it's actually, is there a possibility of re, you know, so uh, poss possibility of changing that. So my challenge today is just trying to take that look at your own service and look at other services while you're away from base and just thinking about could it be done any differently without making people, because I know the MS nurses are on the verge of burnout because they are so busy. Then. Yes, thank you very much. Really, I want to thank MS Trust for supporting the appointments of new nurses in the UK because Coventry is going to be a beneficiary of that, so we're grateful for that. One of the difficulties we have, the more number of nurses appointed within trusts or hospitals, MS services, really will be absorbed by the demand through DMTs and managing the relapse and remitting patients, mm. which again leaves the progressive patients, but particularly those who are disabled at home and cannot have access. What some of the Parkinson's disease teams have done is to appoint nurses within the community as well, so that they actually cater for those who are not able to get to hospital. And that way they have a greater impact in reducing admissions, bringing patients who are relapsing and so on and so forth. Is there a way the MS Trust can look at working with the CCGs to look into that? Because I know you just pump prime post, but how do we get nurses into community to cater for the other group that are not properly managed within hospital setting? One of the, yeah, I, I really support what you're saying. One of the things that I want to do, one of the differences I'm bringing to the MS Trust is normally a CEO would start and come in, new strategy, and come up with big new ideas. The reality is I already think we've got the new ideas in as particularly t but providing more of those MS nurses. 
One difference I want to make is to be more external facing as an organisation, to collaborate more with people like you, collaborate more with the MS Society, but also start to influence and steer where we can see that things could be better and more efficient, whether it's talking to CCGs, talk, talking and meeting Adrian on Wednesday. So we want to be out there trying to steer and influence as a relatively small charity. So, uh, and if I can get your support on that, Abdullah, I'd appreciate it. Oh, David. Um, and I know I spoke to you last week. Uh, there's just a couple of things. I'm with you saying about the nurse prescribing. I mm. am a nurse prescriber. Mm. I don't mm. think it's the right thing for everyone. Mm. I mm. think you need to look at the job role and actually yeah. the benefit that it will have. There's also the training issue around nurse prescribing yeah. that as nurses we have to go through that our medical colleagues don't have to go through. And the annual update is... That's so it's on top of the day job. As I say, it's beneficial, but I think you need to be very clear of the benefits that it's going mm. to bring. Also, with MRI ordering, uh, what you have to sit through is mind numbing <laughs> as a, as a non medical person ordering MRI scans. But again, it's not just the ordering, it's who interprets. And I think you need yeah. a very clear governance line. Mm as nurses and as Hussein's alluded to, the indemnity that sometimes is lacking from trusts when you take on these extended roles, you really need to be careful. And I know there's a lot of nurses that won't take them on because mm. they feel that they're in the firing line and that they're not covered. So there's a whole different thing. Um, I'm, I think speaking up for the nurses, yes, we are overwhelmed, but mm. I think there's also a very big, um, we know that there's a need to actually look at the MS person as a whole, not just about the drug monitoring. Yeah. Um, and we, we need to hold on to what the specialism of nursing is. And I think we've sort of lost a way a little bit with mm. that. But I also think that there's enough um, voices in the room here and certainly nationally that we will get it back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can't agree more. Hi, David. Um, it's Lou Jarrett from Exeter, a nurse. Um, this is more a comment, really, um, and a concern I have, I guess, that I hope perhaps this afternoon we can think about and the Academy can take forward. We do need more MS nurses, but I'm worried where we're going to get them from. Mm. And the education of MS or of nursing has gone into the university. That has been an exciting thing. But we have lost specialism. And I know I can speak, there's a lot of us in the room with grey hair who went through <laughs> neurology courses that really set us up mm. to be able to then to do a degree course. I've just had the experience of trying to train a band six. It's hard work. Mm. They do not have the neurological knowledge so I hope this afternoon one of the things that comes out is a way of us as an MS community actually looking at where are we going to get these nurses from and how can we prepare them or are we needing to look more at our OT and physio colleagues as well as providing some of this care wow that's really controversial so I'm going to give that but I'm with you Lou about retaining that specialism and you know so we worked uh, shoulder to shoulder on the right care pathway our position in particular was that we couldn't generalise those specialisms too much because otherwise we just water it down and everybody knows what happens then. Uh, hi, uh, John Thorpe from, sorry, Gavin, am I butted in? No, no, no. no. So from uh, Cambridge and Peterborough. Um, just an observation, really, because Megan Roberts is going to come and uh, meet with us in a couple of weeks' time to try and improve the provision in Peterborough where we are very much on the wrong end of that curve in terms mm. of um, the number of patients on the MS nurses case load, trying to persuade trust boards, because I mean the, the, the initial response is that the, the, there's an embargo on investment appraisals, is actually you know, trying to persuade trust boards to invest, even when you can see that there's a saving, it can be very difficult, and sometimes actually, mm -hmm. you know, actually pinning that down, rather than you know, the sort of potentially they'll save this money, so, so it would be very interesting to, to know how easily we can persuade uh, trusts to spend money to save money. Yeah, I, and we've got those numbers. We had the evidence, particularly from the forward view. But so we, as we've rolled out the likes of John in Leicester, we've just put another nurse into Middlesbrough. I was talking to Adrienne about this last night. So the numbers are there, and now the evidence are there that it works. So that 77,000 saving, it's come from evidence. And we, when we come to Peterborough, we'll show you those numbers, and you can share them with your board. So hopefully you can persuade that they're going to save us all money as taxpayers. So Gabriel DeLuca from Oxford. Just to uh, build on the comment from my colleague, uh, Emma Sinner Specialist, who was talking about the lack of education in nursing. Uh, in North America, they're moving on to these advanced practice providers, where they have curricula that are very much tailored to subspecialty training and really developing those skills in a formal way. 
Is that something that the MS Trust would consider doing to expand its programs beyond just the traditional nursing, nursing pathways, but that advanced practice practitioner pathway? We, we need to do whatever is best for people with MS and those nurses as well. So the reality is that we all know that the NHS doesn't provide enough. We provide as much as we can. But if we can make it fit for, fit for purpose of the 21st century, we've got to evolve that. So we, we can't just stand still. So I absolutely support that, Gabriel. Hi, David. I'm uh, Ben Dord. I'm one of the five pharmacists in this room at the moment. Um, we have an army of uh, trained prescribers, independent prescribers, very comfortable with interpreting blood test results for drug toxicities. There's an army of us who are desperate to do these sorts of things. And if I can make a, a, a number nine, if you would engage <laughs> pharmacists, with, and it's happening already, we do it in other areas. We do it in a lot of neuroinflammatory disorders for uh, uh, immunosuppressant drugs. Um, you know, we're not nurse specialists, we have a different skill set mm. and we need to be con conscious of how we fit in. But there are lots and lots of farms around the country who can take pressure off, off the services. So please have number nine for farmers. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And, and sure, it needs to be collaborative. And uh, what I'm putting on here is not a tell, but it needs to be joined up so we all come together and do it. Okay. So last question on this, on this topic. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Agnes Rogan, one of the consultants at Torbay. Um, I thank you very much for such a nice talk and I could only add one key thing that we should empower our MS patients. There is a huge variability of you know, patients overall within the services and I guess it would be nice to run like webinars or summits you know, between the MS -ologists and perhaps MS um, specialists and patients. So. I'd absolutely concur with that. My single biggest observation 11 months into the role is how low the voice of people with MS is in our sector overall compared to the broader disability sector where I worked previously. So I know George is going to be talking to you about this in, in a moment. But I think we as a, you know, the shift, MS Society and us, along with you, we need to find a ways with the pharmaceutical companies of giving people with MS a much bigger voice in the near future.